everyone. Welcome to the Rise Innovation interview series. I'm so excited that you are part of this program. And today I have a very special guest with me, Hector Palacios. Uh, did, I, did I butcher it? Did I get it pretty right. I, I, it sounded right to me. Uh, Hector is a research scientist at Element AI. It's a, uh, a ServiceNow company. Um, Hector, welcome, first of all. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, to give everybody watching uh, inspiration, innovation, and ethical education. Uh, Hector and I shared a few stages on Clubhouse uh, and where the conversation was amazing. And I think he has a lot of value to offer you. Uh, but before he does, Please introduce yourself because you know a lot more about you than I do. Thank you, Sal. It's uh, it's very excited to be talking uh, with you about these issues. You know, we have all these spontaneous conversations about AI and about innovation and how we are just scratching the surface and there are so many things to do. And I am very happy that that many of the ideas you, you mentioned some months ago, they are materializing and uh, I, I'm really happy about this innovation program. So about myself. So yes, I'm a research scientist in, in LMNAI, now a service now company. I have been doing AI probably my whole life in the sense that I started, I was on, almost a teenager, then did my PhD in Spain, and then uh, leave academia, and then have been in the industry based in Montreal for around five years now. Before in academia, I specialized in uh, what I look like calling reasoning in AI, that is in, in these methods in AI when you need to really think and make sure that things are gonna get to get you the solution. For instance, you are in Google Maps and you look for an address and give you the route that better work. Right? It cannot send you in the opposite direction. People would start to complain and then your product would fail because you cannot trust it. And there are other cases like an ad or, or translation when this can be a bit informal, when it's okay, like that you keep learning and adjusting. Uh, this is learning. So now it's, uh, we can summarize that in my previous life in academia, I was doing mostly reasoning. And then in the industry, I have been mostly learning. And then in the last two years, I have been working a bit with both sides. And I guess we're going to get there when we talk about uh, ethics and ramification, and also about innovation, because for me, this has been also a personal job. They're connected, you know, like I think the innovation and ethical issues that arise with building softwares are really powerful and can do uh, multiple tasks and especially can disrupt industries. Um, I, I feel like they're connected and anybody building these type of platforms or software needs to have a deep understanding of, of what effects the software has on humanity as a whole. So I love that you said that. Uh, what What is some of the innovations of uh, different projects that you might have worked on that are kind of close to heart and what is the most exciting for you when, when you're innovating in a company? Yes, thank you for that question. Um, of course, innovation, I mean, the the, 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 the importance of, of the innovation of whatever we are doing is normally judged in retrospective, right? Because in the sense you are excited about something, but sometimes there is a piece missing or sometimes it's not the right time and it wasn't innovative or, or maybe it looks like it wasn't. Uh, we only get to know those that materialize. So there's also something about the attitude there in the sense of putting ourselves uh, in the to try to be in a good setting and environment where that might happen and then well support and after all of that you need a bit of luck to try in the sense that you need to keep trying 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 in a sense this is like sports or in soccer you know you keep moving around and sometimes you finally get to do something that is useful so then i i i, I can probably mention one project in particular that i think I have these aspects but again this is all about uh, the personal interest and the context that enables that so I joined uh, Element AI that, that it was started to base in Montreal, and now we were acquired by, by, by ServiceNow. And we are becoming this sort of innovation lab. Uh, and, and, and right now I'm in the most researchy part of the, of the, of the company. I, I recently switched to doing applied, applied research or innovation to try to also do fundamental research. But before I was doing that, I was hired to be part of a natural language team. I have been doing natural language only since I started in the industry, because basically when I started to look for an applied job, it's the only thing I could make sense of. I don't understand images because there are all these pixels and audio have all these secrets of the team, but in text I called, okay, I can work with this one. And um, so they had me for the, for the natural language team and there was this, so at that point, Element has like many models that they could use in these industrial applications that we were developing. 
Uh, but there was the question about what is it that we can do with these models? Uh, what are the limits of that? What is the procedure for getting the right data? It was a lot about using the models. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that that connects a lot with my background because in academia, basically I specialize in using and reusing and understanding the connection with different models. Like with the standard that this is like doing that, but that. For instance, it's like if you want to do uh, arithmetic with, uh, um, with, uh, with, if you have arithmetic with integers, then you got to fix precision because it's a matter of dealing with the comma. It's sort of uh, conversing of one problem into the other one, right? So then I end up like looking a, a, a lot into this, uh, how is it that we can use the programs? And we end up um, running into, into, into uh, an idea that was that um, the following. Sometimes when we are using a machine learning model, um, the answer that it, it gives you like the most likely, it doesn't make sense. For instance, suppose I, I was working in this project in OCR, and then uh, the an OCR is when you take an image and you turn it into text. And of course, I mean, they, they, we always expect a small mistake that, there, right? But sometimes when you have a pre-trained model, you spend a lot of time there, you spend a lot of money, and then you use, want to use for scanning license plate or some country. In that moment, this is what, well, you know, sometimes there is a precise format, like a digit and then a letter, something like that. And the poor uh, uh, OCR model didn't know this, right? But you put it in that context and it's not just a small error. Sometimes the small errors become all the errors, right? Because it comes to be, it starts to be massively present when you are using that. So this way, in the issue when you have a pre-trained model and you start using another context. And then the question was how to incorporate information from the context so we can use the model in different ways and basically we developed this idea of this method that is actually in production when we can given a pre-trained model that was not specialized at all in recognizing license plate to tell explain the model hey this is the format this is what i could expect so it wouldn't be confused between zeros and O in places where it shouldn't be and then you get something that is correct and to the point that you can go and save that, you can trust that this is what it's doing. So there are many elements there. There is a intense nature of learning and approximation because always, if every time you are learning because there's a margin of error, otherwise they will not margin for uh, no margin for for learning because you are dealing with the error. And at the same time, in some cases, we really want this robustness because there are consequences, right? So if lines are played with one thing, if you have a social serial numbers, if you have a seed code. You cannot make an error with the zip code because the things are not going to go through the mail and then the right. things are going to get lost and it's not coming back from that. So, and then, so this was the idea and the good thing is that I was in a context where, where, where we have time for refining that. We were asked for, 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 for a case where we could we can show that. We were offered the time, we delivered that. So I think it's also, it was very important that, that, that the, the company was receptive to that. And we also found a version of the problem but also close to the company. So there is a thing about innovation, about time, pertinence, timing, uh, and, and the culture that really work on that. So I think that was very important. I think with that, I sort of moving a bit into the next question. I love it. I love it. Yeah, I think it's interesting that you said sometimes the smallest problem become your main problems, right? Your main errors. So when you're kind of focused on dealing with even the most minor of errors, you know, they could really throw off the entire system, right? You could have a beautiful e-commerce system, AI e-commerce system, but if you get the zip code wrong, what good is it, right? Because it goes somewhere else. So I, I love that analogy. What what is what is innovation to you? If 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 you were gonna think, you know, I'm gonna innovate something, what does that mean to you? Um there is like this innovation with capital I. Uh, and there is uh, this sort of day-to-day -day things, right? So I guess it, when we are like in a big organization, we are trying to promote innovation. That for me, this is important now. And since I joined the industry, now I start to understand a bit how the inside out of these companies and also in the society. I also have a different perspective now. Before I used to, used to be in academia, I have now this other view. And, uh, and it seems that innovation, it's, it's like this transversal phenomena in the society that manifests in organizations up to some point, right? And and then we get to see in many cases the the the, the most important results of that. But the, the way this this happen, there have to be opportunities for this innovation to operate at lower levels, right? So then um I guess it's easier if we go by if we go like by, by level by level. It's the society 
this opportunity for for creating new ideas to offer it. well that's without that it's very hard to to innovate and then insert an organization or when you are trying to build something it's a issue don't if we don't find the support for starting something new then it's very hard and and then other thing and then after that we go back to the culture and the people who are doing this um and then i see basically two 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 ingredients um and, and that is related with the progress of history. So innovation in the end of the day is when something appears new. And, and I, one question I ask all the time, every time I think about history, I want, by the way, when I say history, I mean also current history, right? It could be yesterday or tomorrow. Uh, why now? So what is it that this happened now? And most of the time in my, at least in my mind, I keep seeing that many of the elements that, that 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 were the ingredients for that were already there and there is one that arrived in that moment that is what makes it possible there's only one element right? and many of the other were already there sometimes we disregard the other ones and then with this next one there is something else that can be done so in that sense innovations tend to be shallow in the sense that they, they, they are always small pieces and but then it's the synergy of them that produce this sort of uh, this sort of uh, jump, um, and then in, then finally they, it goes back to to people's sensibilities and to people's talents and to people uh, um, will and grind to to try to to, to test things right. And so in that sense, in that sense, there is also like an innovation that happens like in generations. So every time there is a new piece in the ecosystem, everybody has different perspective. And are the people who know them the responsible in history to push those things forward? The first that say it are the ones that are, that have this invitation to push. Them. Um, this is a bit vague, but I I, I think it's a, it's a, it's happening at, at many 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 levels. I love it. No, and I, and I completely agree. I think as more transformers come out and as more pre-trained models come out, I think sometimes the missing pieces is is just a update away to make something work. So I, I always try to tell my developers, I said, don't lose hope if you don't find the solution now. It could be just around the corner within the next batch of jobs that we do or the next updates that happen on JIT or somewhere else. So I, I love that uh, idea. And 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 I, I wanna say innovation is about impact. I wanna say innovation is about creating even the simplest, smallest tools like the electric toothbrush and putting AI in it and doing something special with it. I, I don't I don't feel like innovation has to be a solve all, change the entire world, but if you can improve one thing and improve it in a really beneficial way to society, I believe that's innovation. And I think that with today, with the rise of technology and the inspiration, like everybody's talking about artificial intelligence and I love it, right? It's it's amazing. It's it's like magic uh, in a sense where operations happen automatically. Uh, but it also is not the cure-all, right? This AI, machine learning, it's a helping tool, but it's not going to replace us and it's not going to, like a lot of people have that stigma. And for that, I kind of want to just jump into the next real thing, which is uh, what are some of the ethical background choices when you're innovating, when you're uh, potentially about to disrupt industries at scale? What what is the right or what is your approach to dealing with some of these issues or even considering it? Because I see a lot of talented developers that have no ethical background and have no ethical development uh, ideas. Uh, they just go in because there's either money there or there is something that's driving them to, to just innovate uh, without really considering uh, what damages that they could potentially do to society with even the wellest meaning intentions. What is some, some words that you could say or think about the ethical issues of creating really powerful software that can disrupt industries? I, I think, so first, the, I think the default behavior is not to think about the consequences of what we are doing, right? Oh, I really like that tree. I'm gonna, I really like that flower. I really like that animal. I'm gonna catch it up again home. Well, it's a very, you know, it can be, I guess, and you really like it and then you chase the animal 
that you bring it home, it's going to be your new pet. So this sort of behavior is the default behavior of everyone. Uh, and the, the harder thing is to, is to think about the context or, or about even your personal impact of, of this and then about the context and then what are the consequences. And then for projects that are not just one, one, one action, well, then they could derail very easily if we don't think about all these interactions. Normally, when we are developing a product, when we are developing new technology, uh, because we depend on the society, we get the first validation, right? In the sense, oh, I have been working on this one month, six months, and then there are some, there are there were some consequences of my initial plan that I didn't thought through, and then they were just slapped me in the face. Or people didn't like that, or this turned out to be harder, or I thought about this, but this is unfeasible. And then now, uh, so our ability to anticipate these consequences is part of what makes us succeed or not. It's part of it, you also need luck, but it's part of that, right? Uh, and the problem with ethics and and, and 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 the environment and all these issues is that the, there can be unintended consequences that you are not get to see in the short life of your project. And then you see, you think, you might think that this is okay, right? Like, yes, we're gonna, we're gonna do the industrial revolution. We're gonna have engines everywhere with coal and then everybody's gonna have cars and are gonna make a lot of money in the process, right? And that's okay. But there are always and then the consequences. Some of them we just couldn't see. I mean, people who started this, I, I thought they didn't really try to just to destroy all the trees in the world and just to to and and and, and to destroy nature in the process. They know we are just living here and doing more stuff, right? So, um, and in and in that sense, thinking from an ethical point of view is part of this thinking in the longer term, thinking about the repercussions with different aspects. One of them is the technological risk, and the other one is that well, what are gonna be the consequence uh, from, uh, for other people and for, uh, for, for nature, for this on the planet where we live. Um, and while well, in the middle of the, the friction of, of trying to get things done, I think we, sometimes we forget. And because of that, I think it's very important that we remind this explicitly. So part of the, of the way we get better at thinking about these consequences is by stopping and doubting about what we are doing. The problem is that we, everybody, live, of course, in a in a vision of the world that is self-consistent. I do this because it's good for the world, and then this is good for the world, and it's good for me, and everything makes sense. And it's very hard to break this self-consistency. So we need to find ways to challenge that, and to and to and to, but listening and being open to that is very very hard. It's the reason I think it's it's important to reach out to other point of views and to try to make sure that we are covering more than one angle and to be then responsible enough and we find an angle to hold that thought. Because that's scary. Because there's someone who said, mm, maybe this, it seems very attractive, but it's risky. Maybe for the project or maybe for other consequences. I love it. It's it's true. It, and and it, let's talk about this for a second because you said there's there could be unintended consequences, right? Unanticipated. Uh, even if you are innovating at, at scale and you are bringing projects to market, sometimes you can't see all the dangers that really lie within the the project that you're working on. What are some steps that you can give future innovators that could take, that they could physically take some maybe two or three simple steps that after they, they have an idea and they go and start building it out, and maybe they're ready to test it. What is what is some of the recommendations that you would have to uh, our viewers? I think there are basically two angles. First, when we are when we are designing something, we, we tend to think a lot about the happy path. Oh, this is how things are gonna work, right? And we, if we are smart, then we try to say, okay, there can be this error and this error that I'm gonna fix in this way or I'm gonna change my design so I don't I, I, I'm not so affected by this potential error. So we are sort of covering a region of that, right? Then, then the, I think the, the first attitude is to try to magnify that process. So even if I pull this out and then it was working, and then it was still working, uh, what, what, what might happen here technically? Just just the scenarios now. I'm not getting to, yet into the technical consequences. They can be, um, so what is going to happen? For instance, suppose that years ago we were decided we were designing a product where people can write things and share content in the internet, and then you have friends, 
and people read that. Let's suppose we have this idea 20 years ago, right? Not now, because now it, it will be a bit, a bit late in the market. Yeah, um, like so. It's a, and then in that, in, so one for one question that we are, should arrive quickly is, well, uh, how many friends are I gonna have? And what if all these people are sharing a lot of content? Which one should I show? Should I just show them all of them? Mm. If we're gonna be overwhelmed, I mean, and if I want people to get things that are interesting, how do I do this? So this is like a technical risk about what is the content that you are supposed to show people, and then you find a solution. Oh no, I'm gonna do something. It's gonna adapt so it shows the the content is more is more interesting. Okay, that might work because actually people can get the things that are more relevant for them. That seems like a good idea, and we just stop there. But well, well, turns out these have, have consequences because then sometimes you're gonna keep reading one type of content and not the other, or sometimes you're gonna read things that are more incendiary. And if you have talked about with the sociologists about this, maybe they have told you, well, uh, you know that there is this thing with public communication, but the same phenomena happen, and it might happen to you. So maybe you alone couldn't think about that, but if you would talk with somebody else, then you could. But for that, you need something that they, this person cannot tell you is what are what is the space of possibility of your techniques. So in summary, what I'm saying is that as we need to think about possible risks and different uh, scenarios for what we are doing, we need to magnify that over time and also it's a given important to think that seems to be small and with that sort of wider vision then it's an opportunity for talking with others right read about this and then sometimes it's not necessarily talk with the person you read a book and then all of that the scenarios because we have a deeper understanding of the things we are doing there are more chances that we find a region that we that that deserve further attention because the biggest uh, problem here are the blind spots and our mind is trying to succeed so we are going to fool ourselves to protect the blind spots because we don't want our piece of things to be destroyed by ourselves so we're going to try to deny it so the only way is to be very systematic on this i love it so you eliminate things that you test cons consistently and I, I keep i keep hearing too something is seek outside help seek other yes. uh, other ideas right and i think that has to do with social conditioning you can only imagine based on your past history while others can judge based on their past histories and some people all are different they have different life experiences different visions different understanding even different cultures add a lot of perspective to to really have an inclusive type of system that is non-offensive or doesn't cause any intended harm even even if you overlooked some key points that you can later adjust. So I, I really love that. Um, Hector, uh, one final question before we wrap up. Um, it's been so informative and I love everything that you have to say. Uh, what is some advice, uh, something that you would uh, give if you went back 10 years and you were just starting or 20 years and you're just starting in the AI space and something to motivate you to innovate, but yet be ethical in your approach. What what are some uh, motivating words for our RISE members? The f first one, is that it's something I still try to do, is to celebrate our learnings. Because sometimes we want to do A, B, C, D, F, and all the letters of uh, of the alphabet, and then we only get to do three, right? And then I said, oh my God, I wanted to do only three. I only I only got this A and then a Z and then a, a M. So learning to celebrate. So what is it that we learn? And to try to capitalize that and to build on top of that. Uh, I think uh, the success, the partial success of, of the, what is it that we managed to do are very revealing. And some I think sometimes I have like a refuse to learn from what happened versus what I intended to happen. Mm. So what happened is, is extremely informative about the thing that you can do, what you tend to have more luck, uh, the things that are actually working as they are, not because you intended to do so, right? Of course, this is a bit paradoxical because everybody who is into the business of, of innovation and creative things, we have to be stubborn because there's, there's, the surroundings are not trying to let you do what you were trying to do. So there is a bit of a paradox there, but um. But if anything, we can, I can try to justify this to myself thinking that, well, this is actually being smart. 
right? I'm just trying to let go for a moment, to let go for a moment, this assumption about how things are supposed to work for me and even let myself let go of my idea and just to for a second try to to celebrate and to understand what is it that happened. I think that that's, that's very important and that also reduce the stress around a single project in the mm. sense that we are just trying here. Yeah, we are just trying. And um, um, I think that probably that one will be probably the most important to learn to celebrate what actually happened. I love it. So take things as they are. And, and what, I, what I like is a lot of people will say, celebrate the little wins, which I'm totally for. But what you're saying is even more uh, relevant because you're saying celebrate the learning that you that you've achieved in whatever project you were working on. So I think I think that for me is something that over the last uh, six months that we've been working on Project Hale has been a consistent is is these little things that we were able to figure out that you know that in future programming or future development you would instantly know so i i, I would I, I love that celebrate the learning uh as as you progress uh through your your journey uh, amazing advice hector thank you so much uh for sharing you, your insight i really do appreciate it, you and i hope to be sharing a lot more stages with you uh where can people find you if they want to learn more about hector palacios well i mean uh i'm in linkedin and in social networks as hector pal uh, this is my web page for professional content is hectorpal.net and uh, in general if you look for Hector Palace for artificial intelligence you should find me in some places I uh, it's a pleasure to be here I like uh, I like both having technical conversation about things and I'm passionate of AI and technology in general part of my passion is also to to fight it because sometimes it's not going in the, in the direction I find correct but I, I but in general I prefer to listen rather than just stay close in that in, in my ideas uh so it's a pleasure also to be able to talk about that related with projects with the society so in that sense this is uh, this conversation of us today is like a, one of these very good settings so thank you very much again and good luck and good, good luck to the people who are participating in the project thank you so much and uh we'll see you guys on the next one